Kiora and Malo Lele, and welcome to all of you, uh, wherever you may be um, connecting us from, from your office or still from home. But we welcome all, all of you on behalf of the Health Promotion Forum of New Zealand. And of course, we have uh, uh, distinguished, uh, very dear friends of ours from uh, the University of Otago will be joining us today, Professor Louis uh, Signal and also Professor Margot Baker will join us a little later with uh, Sonny Tuitahi, the Executive Director of the Health Promotion of, uh, of uh, New Zealand. But please allow me to begin our meeting with uh, Karakia and it will be done in the uh, God's mother tongue. Ei koko e ho mau nofu anga, e tautangata mo e tautangata. Te ki tua langi mo e whanua, ko iaia e a fiona. Whawhitai, honga ia, fie fia, whakakoloa. Ko mau lotoia e o tua, e he mau lotu. Mokore ke whakaama mai mua haki i kātupa, e whare mohu poto mo iro e a fiona, i lingi mai ha mau tāpu aki, he ngā awe o mau whai. Lord, we thank you so much for this beautiful day, and we ask that you open a little window for us in your storehouse of love, mercy, grace, knowledge, wisdom, integrity, justice, humility, and understanding. Help us, O oh Lord, and guide us in our deliberations. And this is our prayer. Amen. Thank you again, and welcome all of you for our, um, I think this is the second or the last of a number of series of uh, webinar that uh, has been run uh, here from the Health Promotion Forum of New Zealand. Um, and uh, I think this is one of the benefits of COVID-19 is allowing us to be able to, to meet so many of, so many of you uh, from the different places where you are. And uh, I would just like to welcome all of you. And now I'll hand it over to uh, Sonny Tuitahi, the Executive Director of the Health Promotion Forum of New Zealand. Uh, he will uh, be piloting our ship today as we journey uh, today. And, Thank you once again. Thank you, uh, Dr. Riyami Buloka, for the karakia and welcoming all of us uh, here. And along with your welcoming, I'd like also to extend a, a warm welcome to all the participants and a special welcome to our colleagues and friends from the uh, Department of Public Health, University of Otago, uh, Professor Louis Signal and uh, Professor Michael Baker, as he mentioned, he will join us at 11.30 today. Uh, and to you participants, uh, as you have uh, received from our communications with you, today's uh, webinar uh, is on COVID-19 and it's about navigating the future of health promotion in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Some 12 months ago, we co-organized a timely world conference on health promotion with our international partner, the International Union for Health Promotion and Education. Uh, Luis and I, and uh, of course, Viriami, uh, have been participants in a number of initiatives under the International Union, or its acronym IUHPE, its abbreviation. And so two of the legacy outcomes of the conference were two statements, one on the um, health of the planet, our one common home. The other one was about the indigenous peoples, indigenous knowledge, indigenous rights, and how indigenous rights can contribute to the health and well-being of humans, and equally important, the health and well-being of our one con common home, planet Earth. And COVID-19 has made us uh, do things very differently. You know, this webinar is an example of that. Being conscious of uh, uh, planetary well-being is another outcome of COVID-19. So we are very fortunate to have 
uh, Professor Louis Signal, uh, a director of the Health Promotion and Policy Research Unit at Uni the University of Otago, based in Wellington, to be one of our, our three speakers uh, for today's uh, webinar. And uh, Professor Michael Baker will join us later. So I will hand it over to you, Luis, to um, provide some reflections and some key points that you think it's of quite uh, timely and relevant to our uh, core journey, navigating the space of health promotion and how health promotion can contribute to the well-being of not only our nation, but perhaps also the international reach. Over to you, Luis. Uh, kia ora koutou, uh, ko Louis Signal Taku Ingawa, uh, ko Alma Taku Mama, ko Lyle Taku Papa, ko Rangi Tika Iti Awa, ko Rua Peihu Kimona, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Thank you so much for inviting me today, Sione. Um, I um, have had the privilege of working alongside uh, and supporting Michael Baker and the team of people here who have been, as you know, very instrumental in um, convincing the government to take an elimination strategy uh, and go hard and fast. And um, it's been a great privilege to watch that, to be in the city where, where Ashley has been providing such um, stellar communication and leadership uh, in, this, in this time. Um, it's been extraordinary and I think that we um, constantly forget how extraordinary it's been. We've just managed, haven't we? So many of us have just carried on. I mean, I, I think that they, they, they developed uh, the, uh, they, they did all of the pandemic response when we were in lockdown. There was a few people who were um, in the ministry building still uh, because they were essential services, but by and large, a lot of the policy work that's been done over the last three months has been done. Lots of the government leadership has been done from people's bedrooms, in my case, from their, you know, from their lounges, from their kitchens, with their family and Fano as, as baristas and tea makers and lifesavers. Uh, and um, it's been a phenomenal uh, achievement that we've all made. And I think the other thing is that we've, uh, we've all participated in a health promotion intervention. The nation has been involved in a health promotion intervention. The five million, we are the five million who have done that. And so it does leave us um, some, um, well, I think it leaves us tired. I think it leaves us quite stressed. I think we should all be very conscious of that and you should be in your own lives and in your own work. Um, because it's kind of gone on uh, as, as if in a way nothing has changed, but yet everything has changed. Uh, and of course, now that we're in this fairly secure position in New Zealand, uh, our borders of course are our, our big threat as we've been seeing over the last few days. I think that there's a number of things that um, we can reflect on from this time, and I'm no expert in infectious diseases. As I said, I'm, a, I'm, I'm just a colleague of Michael's and I've sat beside him. And when Sione asked me uh, if I would speak today, I said, well, shall I ask if Michael will be free? Um, because I think he, he has got some um, extraordinary contributions to make, as you know, in this field. And I thought it would be good to hear his advice to, to you. So, um, so I understand and for the start, um, I think one of the things that you no longer have to do is explain what an epidemiologist does. And while many of you may not be epidemiologists, some of you will be, but you all use epidemiology, you all use the evidence, you know, the curve, you're all, we all know about the curve and flattening the curve, eliminating the curve. Um, and so it does give uh, a priority, a focus, an understanding across the whole country about what public health is about. And so I think there's a huge opportunity for us to, um, to build on that. Uh, what it has done, of course, is made us focus on that in the infectious diseases area uh, in a way that this country has not done, certainly since the flu pandemic in, um, in 1918. Uh, that took uh, so many lives, seven times more Māori lives than Pākehā lives at that time. And that, um, that history of that flu epidemic is quite um, well understood uh, in New Zealand, in the Māori community, as you, those of you from there will know, and we've seen the 
tribe in the north there uh, requiring, um, you know, stopping the, having a road closure on the far north um, because they, they know that, that viruses like this can be hugely devastating. It also gives us the opportunity to remind um, all of us about those other public health threats. And I think one of the things I've appreciated about Michael's commentary uh, is that he constantly goes back to climate change, to planetary health. Uh, in his, in his, when he gets an opportunity in his speaking, he says, but this, this, the first pandemic is going to be virus, the second pandemic is the consequences. And this is a big opportunity for us to have a reset. So let's hear from him on what his advice is around that reset. But I, I think that he's right. Um, they could see the mountain, the Himalayas, they could see um, Mount Everest from hundreds of kilometers away uh, for the first time in, in decades because there was no smog. Uh, we've heard the birds singing in ways that we haven't heard before. We've walked on the streets, on the tarmac, on the tar seal, uh, in ways that we could never have done normally because there were no cars. We've seen what a, a, a new world could look like. We've become more joined up. So there are many things that we've shown uh, about how we could stop the world actually, stop the world in a, in a week, stop the world. And so then it does make you think that indeed we could stop climate change. Um, and I think because the five million in New Zealand and people throughout the world are exercised about this, it does give us a much better opportunity for a reset on that point than I could possibly have imagined at Christmas time. At Christmas time, I was feeling pretty um, stuck, really, about um, climate change and planetary health. I just could not see what the break would be, what the what the game changer would be. So I guess the challenge for us here, and given what we know and our commitment to planetary health, uh, is um, to try and grasp that moment in the, the ways that we can within our own whanau, our hapu, our iwi, uh, and amongst our work colleagues and amongst the organisations that we work for and as a, as a society. So I think we can we can be very proud of the contribution of public health and health promotion during this period in New Zealand. We have done astoundingly well, and we know that from the praise we get from the world and and the fact that we're going about our lives without fear. Um, public health works. So you've always going to be able to take that forward in your careers now and in your work with your the people you work for. One of the other things, and Michael sent, uh, um, which I think we just sent out to you, uh, five reasons why we must fight coronavirus and how to make New Zealand better. And he's, he's arguing in there that um, if we eliminate it, uh, we can um, uh, address the in inevitable inequities that would come if we didn't. And I, I remember him saying to me, uh, Polly, Polyfest, I think Sione was um, about to go on this Saturday. Is that the the Pacific celebration in on this on the Saturday? And there was it seemed to me that Michael had certainly been saying that large gatherings were very dangerous. And certainly, if this had got away in the Pacific community, this could have been an absolutely dreadful consequence. And I remember sitting in his office and saying, "Can't you ring the Prime Minister and tell him not to allow it to happen?" Anyway. Um, I think he did ring the Prime Minister, actually, or possibly she rang him, uh, and, uh, and it, it didn't go ahead. That was when we were starting to really understand just what we needed to do um, for that change. And so we've had a very equitable um, uh, impact of the pandemic so far. Um, in fact, it's been uh, white middle class 20-year-olds um, who have borne the burden of it, uh, not necessarily in the deaths, though, but in the uh, cases. So um, that is a huge achievement. And, and so Michael was explaining to me how he and Nick Wilson had been writing about the absolute um, inequity that could occur if we didn't eliminate it. So you might want to ask him some questions 
around that. But I think that is our first major achievement. So when Mickey Ratima and I had the pleasure of working with our colleagues to edit the book on health promotion in Aotearoa, New Zealand, um, in our last chapter, we reflect on three things. One of them is equity, one of the big challenges. And so certainly we see that there in the response to the actual virus. The challenge for us now will be the equity in the second pandemic, if you like, the consequences of uh, the economic shock that will occur. And then what we in our own lives and in, in our workplaces can do to, to address the inequity, inequity which is structurally built into our society that means Māori Pacific and low-income New Zealanders are going to carry the burden of this uh, second pandemic, this economic shock, um, much more than Pākehā, middle-class Pākehā, wealthy Pākehā uh, New Zealanders will, unless we are able to be as, as effective as we were with the, with the virus pandemic. And I guess one of the things that we have is a good understanding of that issue of inequity, of racism, of social class, of gender inequality, of inequality vis-a-vis -vis disabilities, even geographic inequality in our country is, is rife. And we are, we are one of the, the leading, I think, the leading country on, on um, uh, uh, inequity for indigenous peoples. We are well aware of this issue. We have um, ways to think about it. We have a treaty, of course, which is the founding document of our country. Uh, one that we talk about, but don't act on nearly enough. And that'll be a very big challenge going forward for the government to, um, to enact uh, their treaty obligations here. But uh, don't underestimate how much you know in this space and what a leader you can be in your own community. Uh, on the treaty and on inequity, on racism uh, more widely. And we've been seeing some, um, it's interesting, isn't it, that we've had this uh, Black Lives Matter at the same time uh, rise up. Um, and we saw the beating of the Māori man in Auckland uh, by the police yesterday, which I find absolutely unconscionable uh, for tagging, for tagging a wall. Uh, and he was hospitalized as a result of that. So, you know, we don't have to look to America for um, the beating up of, of indigenous or peoples or peoples of color. Um, <clears throat> one of the, the big things with uh, the um, conference last year was the focus on planetary health. And I, I you know, I, I would be wish to say again publicly what vision Sioni had in leading us uh, with that conference and what uh, a marvellous uh, event it was and what a, a thrill it was to be there and to be able to help in some small way uh, with these legacy documents. But if we look at those legacy documents, one of the, um, the main uh, findings of the, of the uh, Indigenous one, uh, if I read it to you, is that uh, we call on the health promotion community and the wider global community to make space for and privilege Indigenous voices and Indigenous knowledges in taking action with us to promote the health of Mother Earth and sustainable development for the benefit of all. And I, I, I totally agree that this is a place where we have answers. We don't have to reinvent them. They're there already. Uh, we have to listen to them. Uh, so I would title um, call that uh, that statement, uh, Why Order Indigenous People's Statement uh, for Planetary Health and Sustainable Development, and urge you to try and make it a living document by using it, by referring to it. The other one is the, the broader um, planetary health statement uh, for um, Why Order planet, Promoting Planetary Health and Sustainable Development for All. And the first point there is the equity one that I've just been making. The second one is around uh, and making all urban and other habitats inclusive, safe, resilient, sustainable, and conducive to health and well-being. And my goodness, wasn't that the case while we were in lockdown? Uh, there was just so much that we were able to enjoy about our communities and our neighbourhoods. Again, we have um, a lot of knowledge and skill in this area, so I would urge you to keep 
that up, to pay attention to this area because it is um, a space where we can be very strong actors. We have things like um, the health impact assessment, for example, which has kind of fallen off the agenda a bit, but is a very useful mechanism for critiquing local government policy making, central government policy making. And we haven't really seen very much of that. And um, if the current government um, uh, approach continues, uh, I think there will be many opportunities for us to utilize that. The health and all policies approach that is also strong and health promotion, the healthy public policy, if you like. Again, ways to think about how to work collectively and I suppose that's another thing you would say about COVID. It's been an absolute example of health and all policies. There's been, you know, border control, police, uh, uh, public health, obviously. There's been uh, uh, social welfare. It's all of these government agencies coming together to, um, to address the virus and to support people during this crisis. We've seen uh, Treasury a major role for Grant Robertson uh, during this period. Really, if you like, health was on the agenda of other government agencies during this time. So again, this is a story that you can use for some time. It's got street cred um, to talk about the importance of this kind of approach. And in a small country like ours, we do have the potential to make very quick changes. So again, that's a big learning from COVID is, it's all impossible, isn't it, until it's not impossible until it's possible to stop the world. And the other thing we have is we have our treaty, we have the two hands document. I think a document that is underutilized in the health sector and in, in um, government more widely, which is talking about moving from the rhetoric of the treaty to how do you actually enact it? I think it's an absolutely brilliant piece of work by the health, commu health promotion uh, community and those who led it. Um, Henny Martin and others, um, you need to actually plan to honour the treaty. And you need to do that within your programmes, within your institutions and as a society. Um, so again, we have tools there that we can use. And of course, we have the HEAT tool, one that you know I'm familiar with, which is again, the Minister of Health has been urging district health boards and other funders to utilise. We know there's some good evidence that it helps think through problems in a more comprehensive and fair way than might occur otherwise. Uh, and um, while it's certainly not the only way to, uh, to do things, it's got some value and has been um, well used by, by many. It's also got street cred, so that can be just useful, you know, modifying, playing with, amending, building on. Um, Bridget Robson and I have been doing work on, on heat tool in recent years and we're not precious about it. If you can come up with a better version, we would be, or a different way or something else, please. Those, we need as many toolkits in our kite as we can. Um, the, the fourth point, the third point in the um, framework uh, from the legacy document is around um, climate change. And I'll, I'll let Michael speak to that a, a little bit more. But again, you can see how health and all policies is a very important tool in that space. And that is one of the things that we've highlighted in the legacy document. And fourthly, building collaborative, effective, accountable and inclusive governance. And I think that that is um, something that we've seen more of in the last three months. I think we've seen more of it from, the, from Jacinda Ardern's government. Um, in the last few years uh, than um, we have in the nine years prior to that. Uh, Jonathan Boston talks about, um, he's a political scientist, he talks about the battle that's going on in New Zealand between what he calls neoliberalism and social democracy. And for me, this is the, the battle of capitalism. So if we, if we accept capitalism, and perhaps we shouldn't, but if we do, uh, what are the options for us within the capitalist model? And we see the Scandinavian example, the example of France, of Germany, of a social democratic, larger government, higher taxes, um, central leadership, um, looking after the people, balancing the needs of the people with the needs of the economy in a more fair, much more fair and just way than the stark neoliberalism that we've had here in this country. We've had a very 
tough um, neoliberal regime for a long time. And we've seen various governments go stronger or weaker on that. Um, but for my money, um, certainly Labour jumped from the left to the right in, in that period of 1984 to 19, 1990. They jumped from the left to the right from social democracy. I mean, Rob Muldoon was a social democrat. As much as I didn't like him at the time, if you look back to some of the times that were there in, in the years before that in the welfare state that I grew up in, uh, in the 1960s in Bulls in New Zealand. Um, there were many things about that that were fair and just. It was very monocultural, very um, uh, racist. Um, but you, I got a free education. I didn't pay really anything to go to university. It's a, it's a very different world that we live in, live in now. And so you get Labour then jumping over to this neoliberal uh, small government, um, uh, individual responsibility position. And we've kind of been vacillating backwards and forwards over on the right, in my view. I think Jacinda's pulling us back to the middle. I think Helen Clark pulled us back to the middle. But in fact, this last few months has started to really go in a social democratic direction, in my view, where you're seeing borrowing by government, you're seeing uh, the that the payouts to employers to maintain their to employees to maintain their jobs, uh, we're seeing uh, um, central control. Um, we're getting the the army in to make sure that we're quarantining properly. Um, you're seeing bigger government. You're seeing um, uh, we've just they had to hire um, I think a thousand people to do the contact tracing in the Ministry of Health. There's been significant more investment in health and public health um, as well in the last um, three months. So again, nothing is impossible when you've got a crisis um, like uh, COVID, you can act and um, we certainly see that. So that's that point four of the legacy document uh, around uh, a more collaborative, effective, accountable, inclusive governance. I think we've been seeing that. I hope it, I hope it continues. Uh, I think it's got enormous potential um, for change. Um, we have this very deep racism in New Zealand and, and I can't be comfortable in where we land on that point. Uh, I think there's much more that we need to do here. We've had absolutely astounding leadership always from Māori in this country and I expect that this will continue, but Pākehā need to get out of the way, uh, in my view. Um, So I think those are my, my comments. Uh, when we talked about, um, in the book, we talk about three things. I talked about equity. We talk about neoliberalism. I just talked about that. And the other thing we talk about is health promotion being on the periphery. And uh, I was just saying to Michael before, you know, that there are strong forces that don't agree with uh, our public health values, with our health promotion values. Uh, who do believe in individual responsibility in small state. And so they are very powerful. They, there are also, of course, major industries like the alcohol industry, which you will know, of course, that alcohol is an essential service. Um, and so that just proves its status, its position, the power of the industry in our society, that we can't not have alcohol um, stores open during lockdown lockdown we have to we have to maintain them being open um, so you have some very large players those big industries that are um, that are very powerful very influential very powerful at our political table but they are being they are being minimized they are being reduced uh, by the power of the people by the needs of health by the needs of the people uh, and so, again, can we capitalise on this opportunity? Can we build on this opportunity to make sure that the rights of the people are seen as more important than the rights of industry to trade, to promote junk food, to um, peddle um, alcohol to our children and make it a normal part of everyday life? Uh, um, there was just a World Health Organisation report that spoke of the importance of reducing harm from alcohol in order to uh, reduce violence against children. It's a, it's a very fundamental issue in our society. So health promotion tends to be on the periphery. I think it's 
marginalised for, for for good reason uh, by these power brokers. Uh, and I think again we've loosened the lid on that grasp on power. And I guess it's our opportunity to try and capitalise on that, to try and move further into the centre. Certainly, uh, public health has moved right into the centre in terms of the current uh, environment. Uh, and um, but it tends to have been around infectious diseases, not non-communicable diseases. <clears throat> and that's the challenge. And it's also been around infectious diseases and not climate change. And that's why I've been so proud, as I said, of Michael for constantly bringing us back to that. So I just wanted to um, say, um, obviously we have an election coming up, so this is going to be very crucial for us. Um, one of the things that the election does for us is also provides this opportunity to um, vote on um, cannabis reform. And I, I just thought I would take this opportunity to urge you to very seriously do your homework on the issue of cannabis reform. Uh, it took me some time, but I am now firmly in the yes camp. Uh, I have, um, I've, I'm gonna circulate this document from the Drug Foundation who have been doing stellar work in my view on the leadership on this issue. I think it's quite possible that the vote won't pass, but for my money, this is taking a health approach to drug use. Um, there are very strict controls, age limits, uh, and so on. And the Drug Foundation, um, they say, um, we all want a healthier, happier, more equal New Zealand. For us, that means treating cannabis use as a public health issue, not a criminal one. Most people who use cannabis do so without harm to themselves or others, but for some, cannabis can have a serious negative effect on their lives. Those people and their families are the ones who deserve our focus here. They have been shamelessly failed by prohibition. Cannabis is the bread and butter of organized crime, and for too long, we've left the regulation of this harmful substance in their hands. To have any hope of reducing harmful use, we need to take back control. We want government to take back control of cannabis Regulation means better health protections for everyone, especially for young people, because of course it will be banned for anybody under 20. Thousands fewer friends and family members pointlessly convicted each year. I think we have to really keep that front and center when we're thinking about um, the issue of uh, cannabis and tax money for prevention, education and drug related health care. So uh, I just urge you to, to read the work of the um, of the Drug Foundation, who I believe are providing very clear evidence. I also see Helen Clark speaking out for a yes vote uh, on the referendum. Uh, but I would uh, urge you to make this your business and to think about this in terms of your work uh, place, places and what your brief might be over the coming months. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you. It's been a great privilege. Thank you, Louise. And it's uh, 11.35. I would expect uh, uh, Michael to join us any minute now. So if I may ask Emma uh, to ensure. Oh, uh, here's Michael joining us. Um, um, Professor Baker does not need any introduction. Uh, the latest you've been on the media this morning, Michael, was on breakfast uh, show this morning. And thank you for that latest advice to the public of making sure that they understand the difference the distinction between uh, being infected outside our borders and then brought the disease into the country. Uh, but um, it's a pleasure and a privilege to uh, have you uh, on our webinar this morning. And um, uh, briefly for the benefit of the participants, uh, Professor Michael Baga is a, a public health physician and a professor of public health from the Department of Public Health. University of Otago. I understand that you've been thinking a lot about not just uh, COVID-19, but the, the reset of public health and the broader picture for our nation. So over to you, Michael. Well, kia ora, everyone, and thanks very much, Sione, and uh, also Louise for inviting me along. I can see on my screen that you don't all fit on even one screen, so there's obviously a lot of um, people out there. and. Uh, um, I don't have any particular planned presentation today. I mean, I could easily run through some PowerPoint slides, but uh, I'd be really guided by you about what would be useful to cover. Um, 
I guess many of you have, we've all experienced um, what is one of the most remarkable public health events, I think, in our lifetimes. And something that was almost unthinkable um, and uh, a few months ago that the entire globe would all be united in struggling against um, this new pandemic disease uh, that really, I think, has surprised all of us. Uh, and then I think the remarkable New Zealand response and the Pacific response, which has been, which have been amongst the most proactive in the world, um, where all of our countries have put public health ahead of other interests, which is a pretty remarkable statement. And I think there's a lot we can learn from that um, in thinking about population health, public health broadly. So I'm not sure if there's, um, Sione, Louise, if there are particular points that you'd like to uh, focus on. Um, and I'm not sure exactly how much time we have for the discussion. Uh, firstly, Michael, um, you take your pick on what issues you'd like to speak on in the next uh, 15 minutes or so, you know, depending on what time you are available to, uh, w with us this, this morning. The, the broad theme of the webinar is post-COVID-19 uh, and navigating the future of health promotion in Aotearoa, New Zealand and, and beyond, of course. And so you can broaden up to include um, the broader public health, the future of public health. I understand that you've been thinking about resetting public health, the centrality of public health in the uh, health system, uh, the review recently, and from your perspective, uh, especially one of uh, those who have been advising the government on uh, the impact and, and the strategies on elimination and all of that. So it's a kind of where we are, where to from here, from, from your perspective, that will be helpful to the health promotion workforce and also the broader public health uh, workforce. Yeah, thanks, Sione. And, uh, uh, it's been a very public event, uh, the um, pandemic and our growing awareness about its um, uh, consequences. And also the um, response in New Zealand, I think has been remarkable because of the skills of our leaders to engage the whole public of New Zealand in the response. Uh, and I think it's a stark contrast with, unfortunately, many other parts of the world one of the things is thinking about the, the pandemic itself is once that virus is unleashed, it's pretty much following its trajectory um, fairly ruthlessly across the planet. And um, there are certain defining features of a new emerging disease. One of the, by definition, uh, we don't know much about it when it starts. We don't know how infectious and how dangerous and how controllable those three attributes and this virus um, turned out to be relatively infectious, um, typically each case infecting two to three others, so that means exponential spread, and relatively dangerous um, in killing half to 1% of people in the populations it's affected. So right away, you know that that means it's going to infect around 4 billion people on the planet and kill 20 to 40 million people. I mean, that's... It, that's what it told us by the end of um, January, unless it could be stopped. And so the controllability became, I think, the huge question. And around the globe, societies have responded very differently. Um, Pacific Islands, I think, had some of the best responses. They um, excluded the virus. That's a um, pretty good approach um, in this situation. And it's worked. Um, other countries that are more highly connected like New Zealand and Taiwan have taken an elimination approach, which is, and Fiji as well, where you get some cases, but you, um, you manage your borders and you stamp out ca these cases. And in New Zealand's case, because we left it quite late, we had to resort to a very intense lockdown to suppress transmission. But using those three things, managing borders, contact tracing, and reducing transmission with a lockdown or even widespread face mask use would also achieve the same thing. Um, it was clear that you could stop this virus and China demonstrated that. But as you also know, the um, 
Um, this really required New Zealand to use all of the um, techniques of health promotion, um, you know, engaging with communities, um, a very effective um, risk communication, um, giving people access to the resources they need to protect themselves. Uh, so, um, uh, and, it, and it worked. Um, and uh, we saw that the, the epidemic curve flattened and then the virus gradually disappeared from the country. And uh, I think the government has demonstrated also they maintain high level of support throughout all of this. And if, if you think about it, if you'd said in advance, will you persuade the entire population of New Zealand to go home and stay home for about seven weeks, that's basically level four and level three, I think many people would have said that would not happen. Um, but it did. And uh, you can see the reproduction number declined uh, from about two um, just before the, the lockdown down to under 0.5. So essentially that extinguished the virus. You can use um, the firefighting metaphor that um, New Zealand basically built the, uh, the, um, um, a, a, a fire break by managing its borders. Um, and then extinguished the, um, the, the, the fire itself with the lockdown and then it put out the remaining hotspots with the, the contact tracing and all of those things worked. So now the post-pandemic um, uh, period that we're in now, what, what does this mean for all of us? Well, for me, one of the major lessons is that um, confronted with a, a lot of very severe threats on the horizon like climate change and loss of biodiversity, um, environmental degradation, growing um, socioeconomic inequalities you, you know, across the globe. These are huge threats to humanity. And uh, what I hope we learn from this, the pandemic is that we will listen to scientists um, and also we will have good leadership that will act proactively on those threats. And I think um, for all of you, I think this opens up huge opportunities in health promotion because we've seen in a very vivid way how all of those techniques have been so supportive of this collective response in New Zealand. And so I, I think we've got now a case study we can keep referring to about how New Zealand and the Pacific responded and took their, their populations with them. And if you look at um, the Great Reset potential, I do think the um, uh, climate change effects and so on uh, are very like a pandemic. They're just coming at us more slowly, but they're unfortunately far more um, harmful in the long term. And also they will get locked in for generations. They won't be, once the CO2 is in the air, it hangs around for a very long time. So um, I really hope that we can use this example, this opportunity for transformative change to deal with these threats. Um, so I don't know if um, there are other specific things, um, Siona, you'd like to focus on or Louise at this point. So I, I can't hear you, Siona, is that... Um, uh, William here, uh, William, Michael. Yeah. yeah, great talk. And, and I think you, 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 you're doing fine. And, and I think uh, Zona was trying to allude to, to uh, you're looking at the, the public health reset. We know one of the, the big issue, of course, with public health is that it has to have a very high trusting environment to operate on. And also the question of, uh, you know, private uh, rights rather than the right, uh, you know, public goods. So, and, and moving forward, I think it will be interesting to see, uh, you know, what your, your views on, on those public health issues, because if we are to continue this, those are elements that will likely to be attacked, and they are currently being attacked by people. Well, I think one of the things with a pandemic disease, it is controlling pandemics and infectious diseases is a classic public good. And public goods, by definition, is something where everyone benefits from them. Um, so no one's excluded. If you stop a an, if you stop an epidemic or a pandemic, everyone is um, gets benefit from that. 
The other thing, it's non-exhaustible. Um, in other words, um, everyone consuming that benefit does not diminish the amount of benefit that's available for others. So it's an economic concept, but I think it, it's an area of um, uh, it's an area of public health where there's such a compelling um, economic as well as human health argument. And one of the things that I think is um, interesting in the the discussion about how to tackle this were these different competing models, like New Zealand took the elimination approach. We're interestingly, we're still the only country in the world that actually is brave enough to say we're doing elimination. Um, other countries, they might say containment. But much of the world is in the suppression mode where they're just trying to dampen it down. And there was, a, as you may remember, a bit of enthusiasm for the mitigation approach. And most countries have given up on that now, but Sweden, I think, still hangs on to that. And there are some people I would describe as um, contrarians or even um, right-wing um, um, uh, people who still think that the Swedish um, approach is best, where you uh, allow a lot more transmission in the hope of getting herd immunity, which, I, which has unfortunately not worked well for Sweden. Um, so I think um, uh, that the idea is that actually public health and economic success um, go hand in hand. It's a false dichotomy to say um, you can, you know, to support public health means that we um, are sacrificing the economy. It actually has not proven to be the case. Countries that have looked after their people also have done better economically. And I think over time, that's going to be the case. I mean, admittedly, this is the most expensive public health intervention in our history. It will cost tens of billions of dollars. But actually, even that is, um, there is an interesting um, economic concept here, and that is your counterfactual. And that's saying, if we didn't do this, um, uh, what is the alternative scenario we would have experienced? And so if anyone says to you, oh, this is very expensive, you say, well, yes, we know that. Um, and people often say it's the least bad option. But you have to say, well, what, where would you rather be? What's your alternative reality you'd rather have had for the alternative scenario for New Zealand? And that is called a counterfactual. What are we comparing ourselves with? For a while, there was a Plan B group in New Zealand who said, oh, we can't do this. We must um, follow Sweden in the mitigation approach. And then they went very quiet on Sweden. And then for a while, we must follow Australia, who was doing a less intense intervention. And now I'm not sure they've gone very quiet at this point. Um, so I think that's uh, an important theme about um, the fact that health and economy do go together. And I think that will be the same for many of the reset um, uh, areas that we might want to talk about. I mean, I think there are great examples in terms of um, uh, travel and transportation um, and uh, what that means. The, some of the alternatives we experienced during the lockdown, the improvements in the equality and so on. Um, but I think, I don't know how you experienced it. I think those of us who are fortunate to have jobs, we could work from home. Obviously, it was quite a manageable period. I feel for people who did lose their businesses and livelihoods and so on, it was obviously a far more stressful period. Um, so again, that will have to go into the, the ultimate assessment of, um, of this event from a, an economic point of view. Thank you for those comments, Michael. There might be some uh, further questions coming through on the chat. Uh, for you and, and for Luis and uh, Viriami is um, uh, managing that and, and he will uh, come in when there are questions. Uh, uh, briefly, um, um, Michael and, and Luis mentioned the timely conference that we had last year in Rotorua, as you might recall, the, the theme was on planetary health. So mm -hmm. it's the well-being of the planet and sustainable development and the well-being of all. And uh, one major part of that was to offer our experience here in New Zealand, especially indigenous knowledge, indigenous uh, health promotion. And um, as you will be aware, that there are two legacy statements that we uh, issued. 
um, two lines of actions that the Health Promotion Forum uh, has taken. One is to establish a global working group with the International Union to further the contribution from New Zealand and around the world of indigenous knowledge, but also to create a more planetary health approach to health promotion. So not only that um, uh, planetary consciousness, but a, an echo social approach. Uh, in a way for me, that's why you're saying that there needs to be a, a fine balance be, between human well-being and economic well-being, and of course the well-being of the planet. You know, at this point in time, our reflection from the Health Promotion Forum, those three things, the balance of the well-being of humans, well-being of our one common home, the planet, and uh, our economic well-being. Um, so fi trying to strike that balance, not easy and very challenging, as you know, but that's where we are heading. In addition to that, we are uh, advancing a, an accreditation framework uh, for health promotion in New Zealand. And it's part of a global framework that the International Union uh, has uh, established. Uh, the unique and important thing there for us in New Zealand is that we, we, we will soon be part of a global uh, framework that is universal in many ways, based on the Ottawa Charter, but we also include Te Tiriti in the social, political, uh, cultural context of New Zealand. So very applicable to New Zealand. Uh, and we think uh, that will help to uh, formally recognize the efficacy of health promotion, as you mentioned earlier, uh, that public health and health promotion um, have played a pivotal role in eliminating uh, COVID-19, but also to think globally and, and act uh, locally. Um, so I'll give it back to you if you have any further comments and also to Luis uh, and just to check with Viriami and see if there are questions. Sure, thanks, Sione, and thanks again for the leadership you've shown in this area and the, at the Rotorua Conference um, declarations. Um, so, um, I don't know if any other questions have come up. Um, I may, I'm just aware you probably have other things to do, you're going to discuss in the session, is that right? Uh, the, the only other question that came here, here uh, Michael, at the moment, and to Louis, is uh, someone is concerned about um, uh, to make any comments, some comments on the uh, psychosocial uh, responses needed in situations like this. Mm. Yeah, um, well, I know we we have some funding from the Health Research Council. We set up a, a co-search group, which is um, on the Otago website, to try and look at um, all of those consequences, good and bad, from this massive disruption of our normal existence. And um, there are, uh, one of my colleagues, Susanna Everly Palmer, a psychiatrist here, has had a survey in the field which has asked people at different levels, level four, three, two, and one of um, the lockdown about um, their experiences, psychological distress, and so on. And she says the results are quite polarized. Um, uh, some people did find it very tough and other people um, liked the experience. So that's um, one of the interesting things. We do respond differently depending on our circumstances and our makeup. So um, it will be some time before I think we can answer all those questions. I mean, I look a lot at infectious disease consequences. I know it's a small part of the health spectrum, but all the infectious diseases transmitted between people basically vanished over, largely vanished over that period. But some actually increased, um, rheumatic fever increased, and that's because the, the bug is carried by people in their throats. And so putting people in crowded indoor conditions increase rates. So it's, you can't predict always how different outcomes will manifest themselves in this situation. Um, so we, we are really committed to trying to document the net consequences of this experience on effects other than COVID. And we, in a way, we're, we're very unusual is that most countries that have been through an intense lockdown was to have to contend with managing the pandemic. They didn't get rid of it. 
So we, um, if you like, I mean, I don't want to, the term would be a huge natural experiment. And we don't want to say it wasn't intended to be an experiment, but it is an experiment that's happened. So I think we've got a huge obligation to understand the consequences so that if we ever in the future have to contemplate something of this scale, we'll know what's involved and how to perhaps mitigate those um, negative effects on people. Thank you, Michael. Um, unless if there are any further questions, Briami, from our participants, I would like to um, thank you. I'm aware of your other commitments, uh, Michael, but we really appreciate you know, having time to share with us your, your reflection and the excellent work that you and your team at Otago you know, are doing for the country. And, and may I, on behalf of our board, express our gratitude to you and the great work that you do you know, for the country. We, we all benefit from that, and this is an opportunity for us to say thank you again for, and keep up the great work. Uh, we are right behind you. No. Yeah, thanks, Sioni. And I also want to really thank Louise and the other people in my department who really stepped in to help out and made it possible. And I think it's also the, the reason I, when people say, oh, why do you have, why do you have um, universities and why do you have all these uh, people sitting around contemplating things? Well, I think one of the reasons is so you've got that reserve capacity in society when something comes along that you can, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, you can actually um, focus on it intensely for a period and help out. And so I feel privileged to be in that position that I was able to drop my day job and <laughs> do another, a different day job for a few months, which is still continuing. And also my colleagues, Nick Wilson and others, Amanda, who was just stepping in behind me, who have also done the same thing. So I think that's part of being in, in our society and being supported by all of you as well. So thank you. And thanks for the opportunity. I can't, you are just names on a screen for me. I don't, I can't actually see you all there, but it's great to be um, interacting with you today. Thank you, Michael. Okay. Um, yeah. See you all later. Thank you, Michael. Okay. Louise, I may, may turn back the, the microphone, so to speak, to, to you. You know, some of your earlier points that you make, you might uh, have had a ch another chance to reflect on those and some of the things that Michael, you know, mentioned. But when in your uh, part of our session, you uh, touch on many key points from the importance of uh, governance the, the, you know, ultimately that the, the um, uh, COVID-19 is a planetary health uh, uh, issue. Uh, you come down to the role of, of health promotion. You touch on the existing tools that are there uh, from health in all policy to uh, two hands. And of course, the statements from the conference. Uh, it will be helpful also for the participants to know that uh, the Health Promotion Forum um, has developed a number of uh, uh, Pacific tools, as well as uh, some uh, uh, Maori uh, tools for our collective toolkits. They are available on the on the um, our website, and uh, participants and colleagues are, you know, welcome to utilize those tools that that are there. Um, so I'll. I'll Hand it back to you, um, Luis, for any uh, you know final uh, comments you may wish to make, and and for Viliami just to make sure that uh, we have touched on the questions uh, given to us by our participants. Yeah, so I think I just posted to you a couple questions that you you can look at that because I didn't really understand it myself, <laughs> but uh, <Okay. laughs> maybe you can have a look at it and and these days. Um, but anyway, uh, Luis, you go ahead, and then I will. Uh, um, Korikoto, um, Michael, um, Mark, uh, Mark T asked Michael um, if uh, many of us who worked in health were astounded at the lack of government action early on in responding to COVID-19. During the last few months, it seems that at key times, you, Michael, often pushed the public conversation just one step on from where the government action for an, or an action was located. Uh, was this a conscious strategy? And I, I'm sure that um, 
Michael would be happy for me to say indeed it was. He was very consciously trying to um, provide the leadership um, that was needed in the in the in the situation, and I think he uh, was absolutely instrumental in being able to convince um, Jacinda and the cabinet to uh, to take this approach of elimination. The problem with the virus is that, as people were saying at the time, it's a very tricky virus. And the planning we had was for influenza, which of course has vaccines and treatments. Uh, and so this has no vaccines, no treatments. And um, uh, although we're starting to understand them now, but certainly not a couple of months ago. And um, and uh, was operating uh, very um, differently, especially with this asymptomatic um, um, nature of it so that it was very hard to it was and very transmissible uh, also people didn't die of it in the same way that they did from SARS so they were really having to kind of learn about this coronavirus at the very time that they were also thinking about how to, to act and so um, it was a very deliberate strategy by Michael Amanda Kavalsvig, Nick Wilson, uh, others um, up and down the country um, working with the ministry and the government to um, try and um, a push for this direction and you still see Michael now pushing for masks um, which we haven't quite embraced yet they've been concerned for a while about the border control and uh, we saw that fall apart um, but now looks like it's secure again um, so yes a very conscious strategy somebody else asked about uh, work as a human right as income as a human right and I one of the conversations we were having was around a universal um, um, basic income UBI, and I'm a great supporter of the UBI. I think that that would float so many boats for us um, in terms of um, you know health and well-being. Um, we have uh, our minimum wage is still less than um, Australia. Um, we um, have benefits that are way below uh, a living wage. In my view, we, this is a movement that we need to be championing, and I would I would really um, encourage you to learn about that if you don't know already, and to see what we can do in terms of pushing that. It's gone off the boil a bit, um, but it was being touted quite a bit a, a few months ago, a month or two ago. Um, this idea that everybody should have a, a basic living wage um, uh, makes good sense to me. So thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you. I would um, love to hear from you if uh, anybody wants to be in touch about um, uh, your your work. Uh, it's um, I think one of the things I would say is that Michael's been um, successful in getting some funding from the Health Research Council, as he said. Uh, and one of the gaps that we're really noticing is, and, and Liami is working with us on this, um, is that we don't hear people's voices. We hear um, the leaders and we hear maybe the health sector or the key stakeholders, but we don't actually hear the voices of the people. And so you are very well connected with your community. So whether that's something that you as a collective or within your institutions, your organizations could do more of collecting that, those voices about the challenges of living through um, the COVID epidemic, the first one and now the second pandemic. Uh, and um, feed that through to policymakers because they're not hearing, they're not hearing those word, those voices nearly enough. So take good care. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Louise. And again, we all you uh, an expression of our gratefulness for all the work that you've done for the forum, but also last minute notice, you know, being willing and able. Uh, to join us and uh, appreciate the uh, ongoing cooperation between the, your team and our uh, team here. And uh, unless uh, there are any further questions, Williami, uh, well, we can. Uh, uh, thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you, sir. I think it just that someone was saying about um, you know uh, things planetary, thing universal, uh, usually not very good. I think it's you know, uh, but. Um, but I think there has been discussion now that um, uh, the, the concept of the idea of uh, personal right versus uh, public goods and things like that. And yes, of course, there are issues with big organization or, um, you know, global uh, dictating. As, as he, I think it's the point that Louis had just made. Uh, oftentimes, we don't hear the little people on the ground 
but we hear the, the authorities and, and not being able to get in the, the, the reality of what people are. At. Um, but I think this is really why health promotion as an approach is not only working with the system, but enabling the individual and the community so that uh, we can adjust the way we do business to cater for, for everybody's uh, needs appropriately. Yeah. Uh, and I just want to thank all the people who um, who participate and post in some information, uh, give us uh, a link to some of the information they want to share with us. And thank you very much for doing that. I think that would be really helpful. And over to you, Sione. Thank you, uh, William. Uh, Luis might, uh, would also like to comment on the planetary part of, the, of that question. Um, my uh, quick response to that is that uh, we have come a long way uh, in our um, um, social evolution as humanity from the family and tribe to the nation state. And now we are at the planetary level and the challenges that we face are very global in nature and no one single state or nation can um, address that adequately. Uh, you might uh, have heard the call by the uh, Secretary General of the United Nations that it's about sol solidarity uh, at the global level and collaboration at the national level. Uh, look at the role that WHO, World Health Organization, has played in this uh, pandemic. Look at the facilitation of uh, policies across nations and, and trade and economy. Uh, Louis touched on neoliberalism and its implications and, and applications. And we are suffering because of allowing uh, the um, commercial sector to dictate our journey. There needs to be a fine balance. The elected institutions, public institutions that is, and the elected officials have a pivotal role to play to make sure that uh, so in society it's fair and equitable. And uh, public goods are in place, uh, as Michael has referred to. So uh, while uh, our journey towards uh, being globalized uh, has many challenges as we face today, um, we need to organize things from the global level down to the local uh, level. And uh, health promotion and public health have a pivotal role to play in that, especially with the well-being of the planet, well-being of humanity, and the well-being and the well-being of our economy. Because those three things must come together, um, and, and we'll try to strike the right uh, balance. We can't go back to the village situation because, if I use the analogy, the whole home is burning. You can't just concentrate on your own little room in your own little village, your own little country. We have to look at our one common home now and think of how we can work together to solve that. You know, as I, one of my remarks at our conference last year was that we are now a one world, you know, one people with all the diversity and one health. You know, that should be the, 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 the mental framework and the heart framework that we should understand the pivotal role of health promotion not just local and organizational and national, we must also contribute to the global level. Um, so Luis, you might have a, a final remarks on that before we, we close. Uh, never underestimate your own individual power to do something. Well, thank you everyone. And, and thank you again, uh, Luis, uh, for uh, your contribution and uh, Again, we say thank you to Michael, uh, although he has uh, left our webinar. And Viriami, thank you for the leadership in uh, bringing us uh, together. And the rest of the team behind you, Emma and Lavinia, and the rest of the team from uh, Health Promotion uh, Forum. And to our participants, thank you for um, uh, spending time with us and sharing some of your knowledge and your questions. Uh, if you have any further questions or uh, need for the uh, uh, resources that we mentioned in our uh, session, uh, by all means, um, contact us and we will uh, send you those information that you might need. Again, uh, thank you again for participating.
participating today and have a, a wonderful working day. Thank you.